to Master Tour Yang Shipping Online. We're about to get ready for round number three of Swiss with myself, Rodan, as well as Derek Brown. We have uh, No Hands Gamer going up against Mega Gliscor. No Hands Gamer, a former Tour Stop winner. Mega Gliscor, a uh, former regular for the ACT system back when we had playoffs and prelims to qualify for regional championships. And so, you know, they're back and an opportunity to potentially put themselves in good position for the rest of the Swiss. We're going to be playing five rounds today. And then we'll be finishing out tomorrow into our ultimate top eight on Sunday. And remember, this weekend, we'll be crowning three new grandmasters, potentially No Hands Gamer as one of them. Yeah, the current front runner for Americas. And I think we can all agree after a, a suite of very deserving players went through to Americas last year, obviously a Gallon uh, after the uh, first season of Grandmasters. And then a Language Hacker, I think in particular, but also a very ugly Empanizado, Papa Jason, all of them, uh, despite having varied results in their first season of Grandmasters, deserving players. And now the question starts to be raised, who deserves to go in next most of all? And one of the names I hear most is definitely No Hands Gamer, one of the longtime grinders of Hearthstone and biggest innovators as well. And so going up to three and zero, whilst already being the number one money earner, would put him in a great spot to do so. And uh, at the very least, I personally just love watching him play Hearthstone with his unconventional strategies. Yeah, uh, No Hands Gamer, you know, we've talked about it already, setting up the stage, kind of talking about how he likes to go against the meta game, and I think Priest is potentially one of those classes that can do it. Priest does have much more polarized matchups, you know, for example, it seems to be doing fairly well um, against a lot of the warriors out there, but you know, people wonder how good can it hold up against Hunter or Druid or mm. even the Warlock that people get their, uh, the burst. So far, it seems like uh, that holds true, except against Warlock, it's been fairly competitive at 50% right now, 4 out of 8. Um, which makes me think that there might be more to this Priest deck in terms of how it can handle certain combo decks, or that the Warlocks that uh, no, hands been, no Hands Gamer has been going up against um, seems to be fizzling out a little bit, or perhaps uh, they're just kind of not working out there. So I am looking forward to see a little bit more data before we can draw any conclusions. But for now, I think the Prius might be, a, you know, one of the best springs that you can have for this tournament to gain an edge. Yeah, it, it's a strategy that was very popular a couple of weeks ago when uh, the uh, Priest was kind of most exploding in popularity. You know, Zanananan had hit rank one legend and held it for a couple of weeks with this Priest deck, uh, as well as a lot of the other very strong Priest players like uh, Moyen and Tic Tac as well. It just seemed like all the rage at the time. And a lot of players started bringing it to GM as well. Casey brought it, didn't ban the Warrior, I believe, so to try and go for that strategy. Mine. He now himself admits that to be a mistake, interestingly enough. I think most players have moved on from this kind of thinking that no hands has gone for but uh arguably preemptively uh yeah and i and i mean it just has to work for one week it doesn't have to be like something that mm. is definitively the best bring for every tournament moving forward because it might be one of the things that you're talking about where people start expecting it that's when priest becomes significant weaker so in a way the wheel could end up favoring no hands gamer in terms of what people are thinking because there's no, like, 100% guaranteed strategy uh, in a game like ours. So if it is, uh, I'm sure we'll hop. <laughs> so getting into the uh, Warlock versus Rogue, one of the... Uh... Matchups you don't get to see all too often uh, because it seems like half the players are going with Warlock, half the players are going with Rogue for their third or fourth deck. Um... But it's a very interesting one, in my opinion, because one of the things I always think about when I'm playing Rogue in this matchup is, man, if I had Leroy in this deck, I would have like a 90% win rate. There would just be no chance for the Warlock to get ahead in the game because you push so much damage. And that's really what a lot of the Rogue decks are missing to capitalize on all the damage that the Warlock is doing to itself. Uh, but No Hands Gamer list here with uh, double Eviscerate in the stealth package may be able to get that little bit of extra burst to get over the finish line. Yeah, Stealth Rogue, in my opinion, is one of the trickiest decks right now to evaluate in the metagame because I think that there's just not a lot of data out there. And the, one that, the ones that are are sometimes you know, obscured by what exactly is Rogue playing. Rogue seems to have a very flexible range of packages they can put in. They could play Spy Mistress and Secrets, for example. And so I feel like a lot of the data out there is pretty hard to interpret right now. But the, the mm. bottom line is that this deck gets onto the board much faster than Rogue usually does. 
that uh, play secrets and the tempo that you can generate while sometimes keeping up that card draw is a uh, pretty astounding as time because you know rogue has the great heart sage and then they have of course the treasure from cogwoggle and of course galakron himself which is just a ton of resources. So many possibilities. Yeah, the thing that I hear from players whenever they're talking about Stealth Rogue, uh, talking to a lot of players pre-submission about what kind of Rogue they wanted to bring, is they always say, really, really want to bring Stealth Rogue, but I really don't want to play Sky Vatir in my Rogue deck because that card is just so sad. And uh, I can kind of see their point because, you know, you want to play what, three ones, not one threes. This Spy Mistress is insane in the amount of damage it can push right now. And it means No Hands Gamer is off to a very convincing start here. Yeah, and, and just a world difference when Rogue starts with an aggressive one drop versus not. Um, you know, we've seen it in the past. This is where Rogue excels. Quite honestly, there's not even... A reliable remove outside of Dark Skies, and <laughs> yeah. Discord already took a bit, lot of damage to get to the point. But while he can clear this turn, and you know, it wasn't exactly the ideal start here for Warlock. In terms of the punishes for the following turn, there's no faceless corruptors in the deck, so you're not looking at a board that becomes impossible to deal with on the following turn. But just with the sheer amount of damage you're taking, tapping there just feels that little bit too greedy. Yeah, certainly. And now Mega Gliscor, you know, doesn't have a very good proactive 5 play, but he does, or sorry, a 5 mana play, but he does have the coin, which gives him access to 6 mana, mm. potentially allowing him to start developing on the board. Um, I think a common mistake that, uh, you know, people who might first play this deck is they just simply think that it's a control deck. Um, mm. When a lot of times the Warlock is actually looking for major tempo swing try to decisively fight back I the board because cards like Abyssal Summoner, they're, they're really hard to deal with, actually. They can be, for sure, especially without the uh, Blackjack Stunner in the Rogue deck. One copy of Sap in No Hands Gamer's list, which is far from core in this Stealth Rogue. Could play off, pay off some pretty big dividends here. 7-7, uh, seven, seven, that is inconvenient for New Hands Gamer to overcome. Um, does pick up that Devoted Maniac as well, but uh, it is fairly expensive investment. So New Hands Gamer gonna go ahead first and look what the Lackey can dig Ooh. up. Finds another Eviscerate opportunity here. That was, in my opinion, quite close. Uh, the Dirty Tricks, I really liked the, the thought of because you want to hit some card draw here. You know, you need Togwaggle, you need Galakron, you need Kronk. Something like that I think is necessary to close this game plan out at the moment because even though the Eviscerate is nice for sure and it definitely makes for a more threatening game plan, it is uh, unlikely, I think, to actually get there for lethal in the next few turns. Not to say that yeah. it's wrong though. Yeah, and I mean that I think ultimately No Hands Gamer may be just holding on to that Eviscerate in case Mega Gliscor starts counting ranges and starts playing a little too greedy. You know, a yeah. lot of times Warlock, they will try to win the game with one HP. Uh, and they will like calculate how much they can tap. Yeah. Like, okay, this is how much you can do. So there is that X factor now that the Ethereal Lackey has played. However, the longer the game goes, I'm sure Mega Gliscor will start accounting for range possibly. Like, you've been holding this uh, Lackey card for like eight turns. There's surely uh, some kind of trick up your sleeve. So well, ironically enough, there isn't a dirty trick up his sleeve anymore. It's an eviscerate instead. It's not really a dirty trick. It's more of a, of a messy one. It leaves your body and <laughs> slices and bits. <laughs> uh, Mega Gliscor here kind of stuck in what it feels like probably a harder turn if he wants to maybe just draw cards or play for tempo. Like yeah. On curve here. I mean, there wasn't really anything that looked good at all, though, because the two options were, as often is the case with Warlock, you can, you can either say, I'll make do with what I've got, try and fight back with the cards in hand, and obviously what comes in the, off the top. Or you can say, I'm going to tank the damage now, have a horrible couple of turns, and hope that the cards I draw off the top will get me there. And uh, that line would have looked like the uh, Questing Explorer plus Mortal Coil. But with rolls like that, he can do what he wants, I think. Yeah, oh my. Game That's a bit better. Uh, Pain blood hoof. That's a <laughs> significantly better death rattle. Um, at least in terms of what he's trying to do. And now this is actually really hard because Mega Blizzard he ends up 
using AoE to remove the board, he's really not going to be able to do that here effectively. And so for Mega Gliscor here, uh, he still has the same options to draw cards mm. to start off the turn, but he's going to be restricted in his mana. Uh, the Abyssal Summon actually just straight up takes seven mana to play, so many which yeah, is I, a big investment. I really struggle to see that being the play. I think I want to see him start digging towards, uh, you know, Netherwing is okay. It's kind of along the right lines, but I'm thinking more uh, Nether Breath along with the Moag or Dark Skies to clear this board. Uh, or Plot Twist in the ideal world to actually just start going for his own win condition. This is one of the things that the players uh, are consistently ragging on other Quest Warlock players for is they don't complete the quest enough. They just focus on clearing board instead of getting their own win condition online. Yeah, the crazy other wing here might just be his best chance to fight back simply from board presence because it's such a challenge to clear blood of. Uh, downside, of course, is you damage yourself and your opponent draws an extra card. Oh my goodness. Galacrond off top, and he already is fully Whoa. invoked. I mean, this is this is just potentially lethal right here. Very possibly. Uh well I mean oh one mana off the actual eviscerate lethal right now. Okay, well, I mean, he picks up a bunch of cheap cards, which can still um, basically present two turn lethal anyways, and he also still has the weapon swing, and this is still looking really bad for Mega Gliscor, no matter how it's being sliced. Frozen Shadow Weaver on the uh, Nether, uh, Nether Wing as well is absolutely insane to play around Dark Skies as well. That's five more health on the board, makes this incredibly difficult to deal with for Mega Gliscor here, and this is not the way the matchup usually shakes out. Nohan's Gamers Rogue here has some real teeth on it. Oh yeah, I think that's you know the benefit of having a lower curve deck and perhaps yeah. even just having that Spy Mistress on one that can't get dealt with easily. Right we didn't even really necessarily talk about the advantages of having that early Lackey. Oh, those find Nether Breath though. So with the Moarg, that is a full clear on Nohan's Gamers side. Uh, of the board if Mega Gliscor so chooses. I think it's not going to be enough though because if he so damages himself through a Reign of Fire, he goes down to 2 and then heals up to, eight, heals up to 10. Right. Um, and there's a weapon in Eviscerate. I guess he doesn't actually exactly have lethal, but it will Okay, this is the line he has to right. clear up the board, heal back up, stay alive as it currently stands. Even from Nohan's gamer's perspective. Yep, but he is he is alive, which is a, a lot different of a scenario than I thought it would be at this point. You know, you kind of mm -hmm. talked about how Rogue um, isn't supposed to be able to pressure this quickly, and because of that early start from No Hands Gamer, he's just constantly in that threat range. I wonder if, in his mind, oh, I that was the Goblin Black Gamer. <laughs> Could still search with, like, Seal Fate, his own Frozen Shadow Eva here, if he's just giving up on board control. Uh, probably not the way to go. In the shadows. It does seem a little excessive. It doesn't seem like we're in that desperation stage. Yeah, yeah. You do have to kind of think about like what your opponent can do for the scenario. So if he's not going to have lethal, I wonder if he's going to swing at all because then that would mm. make his opponent's Alex Straza better. I mean, he could but... seal fate his 1-1 one -one here instead. That still buffs up the Edwin, makes it that little bit bigger. It's uh, just about how crucially thinks of that as a card if he doesn't hit it, which I think is fair to say you want to hold on to it. All right. Um, does make it seem like if his opponent did have Alexstrasza, that this would be a little bit, a lot harder That's actually true. to get that lethal. Yeah, that swing. good point. Um, doesn't seem to be the case, though. I wonder. Yeah, even with the Shadow Step on the Goblin, still doesn't uh, quite hit lethal. Right. So, Shadow Step on the previous turn in order to make an 8-8 Edwin. 
or a 10 10 even sorry would have been i think a oh. little bit more tempting oh my Nether gosh breath off the top with the second moog as the previous draw these are like the exact cards one after the other that needed to come down for mega gliscor to even have a chance yeah but the the, the window is opening a little bit more because as, you know, No Hands Gamer isn't really developing super proactively, and right. the window, the window for No Hands Gamer is going to rapidly close once Mega oh. Discord finishes his quest. Okay. So and now the uh, the question is begged, sorry, about what this shadow step is really being held on for. I suppose Kronk's in the ideal situation. Totally. Yeah, I mean, if anything, he still had a draw for people with. Him. So, just set up the best board. And again, push that one damage and still kind of be in threat of that Kronk lethal the moment he draws it. Pretty good minions being generated. Still very threatening for Gliscor. He uh, can't rest on his laurels quite yet. But just a, uh, a Keladan, a Twisting Nether, something like that could pull him back in the game. I wonder how much Mega Gliscor needs to fight for tempo here. Um, he could end up going for like some kind of card draw or just development play, but I mean, there's also yeah. the opportunity just to drop Malagos. <laughs> Malikos with the Nether, two Nether Breaths, Reign of Fire, and uh, Mortal Core is already being wow. used. Means that there's not that many spells left for Malikos to actually capitalize on. So what would you save Malikos for? Exactly, and the other consideration is from the other side. You've seen Sap, you've seen Flick Sky Ship. There really isn't very much your opponent oh. can even go for to actually kill you. But now with Kronks off the top, it's actually still not quite lethal for No Hands Gamer yet again. <laughs> the Aaron Hassey Broodmother draw. So big for Mega Glow Score. If he goes what? 5, 9, 11, even if he shadow steps the goblin, it's still not there. Hmm. If he hit Kobold, I believe that would be lethal. Oh no, he still wouldn't have mana then. He'd be one off because he used the hero power. I still think that you want to use Krogs here as best. And interesting that he's going to prioritize Malagos. There is still a couple of spells that could be threatening for it. So he does find a way to at least destroy it while still presenting the board. Like he's going to score very close to acting as Zephyrus. Must be. It. I mean, it's just plot twist, right? It's the last card you want to yeah, have at the bottom it, of your it, deck. It That's what's twist. stopping him. Yeah, because he's played Coil, Reign of Fire, Soul Fire, Nether Breath, Moark, Dark Skies, Questing Explorer, everything. So many well, he does have two sense deep deck, actually. Well, uh, oh okay. my gosh. Okay. I think that that's it. Uh, if you just play the Iron Nessie Broodmother, you're just kind of dead on board. Any variation thereof. <laughs> Maybe hoping that No Hands Gamer concedes quickly enough after he sees the Zephyrus that he won't have to play it out. <laughs> That's going to do it. No, no Hands Gamer gets the Game 1 victory, Rogue versus the Warlock. Uh, a matchup that has been going Warlock's way for the most part. And Rogue has uh, gotten another crucial victory. Yeah, I think that both players showed very good understanding of the matchup. No hands in particular, uh, prioritizing the damage. That's the thing that Rogue is lacking, as I laid out at the start, with Leroy moving over to the Hall of Fame. You no longer have the burst lethal that Warlock doesn't have much counterplay against. So the Eviscerate being picked at the start, even though it didn't come down for the entire game pretty much, uh, it still was, I think, showing the right mindset. But on the other side, Mega Gliscor, with one of the worst Warlock hands it's possible to have, with double plot twist right at the bottom of your deck, quest not completed for the entire game i think that he uh put up a tremendously strong fight given how bad his draw was that's right and so that's the game one victory for no hands gamer and now i mean i if i if i'm looking at no hands gamers lineup and i'm in this position 
I'm thinking I want to give Priest as many chances to win as mm-hmm. possible. Um, just so that way I have that comfort of, of knowing uh, that, you know, Priest will have good matchups left on the board. Uh, you know, so for example, if Mega Quizcore queues up the Warrior, um, you don't want it to get that win versus Druid because that is on paper a tough matchup uh, for that Druid. Um, in fact, Druid's worst matchup by a pretty significant margin if you just count the small sample size against. Yeah, it's one of the things that I think uh, you start to get lulled into a false sense of security because Warrior is banned so much that I haven't really seen Druid against Warrior that much. But then you'd get a true glimpse of how powerful it can be in the matchup. They have huge minions at the start of the game. They have the clears with the Risky Skipper should they need it as well. It is just disastrous. Whereas here, with the Druid up against the Warlock this time for No Hands Gamer, I think this is a significantly more winnable matchup for the Druid. Yeah, in fact, you know, many people are starting to just assume that Druid is favored versus Warlock uh, uniformly across the board. And with a breath of dreams in the opening hand here for uh, No Hands Gamer, that looks pretty good of a start. Yeah, it's the slightly less fashionable uh, build from No Hands Gamer now that is the full suite of dragons with Alex Draza, Malagos, Ysera, and the double Emerald Explorers. The only uh, common dragon that you're cutting there being uh, the Anixia, I suppose. Uh, and of course, to make room for that, you're cutting the uh, copies of, uh, well, in this list, not only the Savage Roll, but also just the complete spell package, I suppose. There's no Glowflies even in this list. It's just Ramp Druid with dragons. Yeah, Dragon Ramp Druid, which I guess if you're if you're anticipating matchups like Warlock, it'll give you the time to hit that ramp, especially with this oh, kind of yeah. draw. No Hands Gamer just got that overgrowth that previous Oh, turn. yeah. And now he's going to just be able to threaten his opponent in two next turn, two turns? Yeah. I mean, the only thing he could possibly wish for here is uh, an exotic mount seller just to get a threat down on the very next turn. If that comes into play, I think Mega Gliscor can pretty much pack up straight away. But even without that, <laughs> just having the Alex Straza into Malagos combo is incredibly threatening. Of course it's the right way. You can pick up here for Mega Gliscor too, though. And here's that Sense Demons, one of the two. Ooh. Okay, so not, bad. not the mount seller, we but a pretty nice consolation prize. Hmm. Spellkin is interesting, uh, especially with a, a Malagos in hand. I guess there aren't actually that many one mana spells that deal damage to the face anymore. We're not in the Living Roots era anymore, sadly. <laughs> yeah, and there are some like wonky things with Cobalt Spellkin right now and side quests that may True. or may not be good. Although, Strength and Numbers being a side quest in Druid, which is play 10 mana of oh, oh, Dominion, summon a Deck, uh, might incidentally be very good in Druid, but because you oh. can't guarantee it, and you might also be stuck with Claw, um, I think it's... Mount Seller off of Strength in Numbers would be insane. It would be insane. And, you know, I think if he didn't have Evasive Worm, which is also a, a completely reasonable tempo option if mm. you want to play the Crazy Netherwing this turn, um, I think Cobalt Spellkin is entirely <laughs> reasonable because of yeah. Mount Seller, too. Because Mount Seller, you get one mana spells to play with. Uh, yeah, I, w I was practicing a lot the last couple of days with uh, Captain Kitty, Freddy B, a couple of the others in that group, and uh, once did they let me pick the Cobalt Spellkin. Only one time did they deem it correct, and uh, it wasn't even that good. So I'm going to submit on this one. Yeah, I, I think Cobalt Spellkin is more for the uh, the Brian Kibblers of the world. <laughs> where you're not Enough sure what's going to happen, you're pretty sure it's not that good, but let's go ahead and find out anyways. <laughs> So, is this an opportunity for No Hands Gamer to just start turning up the heat with Alex Straza? I mean, it looks insane, right? I'm trying to think of a reason why you wouldn't do it. And just going for it here with the Iron Bark as well, this is such a difficult board to clear off on this turn. Even if he has the Dark Skies, it's still just not really getting there. I mean, it's also good because you put your board down within critical striking distance and... Uh, they have to not only clear, but also be worried about what you can do for your hand. Mm. Uh, I believe Dark Skies does clear everything, but it does. Afterwards, yes, it does really now. Yeah, if he'd gone with the Iron Buck, I think it would have been just above. But in in this instance, yes, 
it doesn't even need anything else along with it. Hmm. And I think uh, for Mega Gliscor, you know, in terms of development, he, he would be quite happy to just go attack it in, Mortal Coil, and then go for the Dark Skies after and fit in a tap. But instead, he's holding back the Dark Skies completely with this line. Right. I guess, you know, Nether Breath hmm. can only deal eight, but Dark Skies has the top op opportunity to go a little bit higher. Also, this develops on the board. Yeah, I think the other thinking as well is that 11 health, or 9 health, I should say, if he tapped on that turn as I was advocating for, it's very possible he just dies. With Malagos double Moonfire, that's the end of the game on the spot. Uh, so this is playing around immediate GG from his opponent, which does have its merits for sure. It's worth considering. Wondering if he wants to play this evasive worm. Um, he would not be able to kill out the Morag Artificer with another Wrath, though. I guess he's okay with it. It's not like Morag. Uh, not like Morag can do too much more. Um, he ended up using the Crystal Power. As yeah, I mean, the more interesting part to me was the fact that he used the trays of the uh, evasive worm instead of just a bog beam to take out the. Uh, 5-5, five, five, because of course it would have been doubled up by the Moog on board, so he could have kept the Divine Shield on this for a card in hand. Uh, which is not necessarily quite so clear-cut that it's worth it, because of course Mount Seller becomes a lot better now, and he just has an extra couple of cards in hand to deal with any bigger threats. It's true, and it is vulnerable to Dark Skies the same way. Oh, oh. my goodness. Oh. Oh. Take it all back. <laughs> Brilliant. He just the knew point. the Mount Seller was coming eventually. <laughs> just happened to come right now. Yeah. Absolutely insane. Even getting the damage to face is just so huge in this spot. Right. And kind of like what you were talking about. You know, this is going to be really hard for the Warlock to deal with. Oh! He's fighting the Big Sword, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much damage does Mega Gliscor need off his Dark Skies? There's 19 health on the board. He can hero power to hold nine hey. cards. Well, uh, he might have to go Reign of... Uh, sorry, Reign of Fire and then Dark Skies, Dark Skies. Uh, even then, I'm not sure that would be enough. It would be like 6 and 7, which is 13 plus 5. I don't think it gets there. Oh, my God. Yeah, I think he's wow. fishing for Keladan. It's not a good thing for Warlock to have to be in a position like this. Oh Whoa! my god! That's huge! Keladan now destroys every minion on the board. Big, big risk coming through here for Mega Gliscor, but this is the kind of play that you need to make when you are down. Take the risk, reap the rewards, and all of a yes. sudden, He's not only in the game, you could argue he's in the lead. Well, he has used another decisive removal option, meaning Malagos could be uh, harder to deal with as the game continues to develop here for Warlock. There is still a couple of other removal options, but remember, Mega Gliscor, he's Whoa. playing like a list of two sense demons. He's not playing a, a Twisting Nether. However, in terms oh of needing removal, if your opponent just deletes their two biggest threats from their deck, you don't even care about finding removal. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know... Was it so bad to play now? Like next one? I mean, I, I think he's just... now, it looks really silly that you have done that. Yeah, he's thinking, I want to play the Mount Seller and the Ysera first, and then follow up when I have the extra Moonfire. Well... You can see his thinking, but it is yeah. not going to work out. Not going to work out, and unless No Hands Gamer is able to... find a way to generate a little bit extra damage here, he's not going to be able to burst his opponent down. Double Moonfire Claw would be 14 with no taunts in the way. But I think Mega Gliscor, now that he finds himself in the lead, is going to be doing everything he can to stay above that low health total. Okay, well, I mean, No Hands Gamer does have another swipe in the deck. So 
though. He does have that bird. He's going to go ahead and go for the overflow because he's very close to the bottom of his deck anyways. Yeah, Alex Straza can be used. Oh, no, sorry. The Alex Straza has already come down. It's... Yeah, looking yeah. difficult in terms of actually getting there with the burst damage at this point, healing up the Warlock actively instead of damaging them. Right, and this was like a position that felt like the Warlock was going to start struggling in after that very fast Alex Braza and double ramp turn. And I gotta ask, if you can't really get a hold and win against a Warlock like this, you know, is is the Druid deck, you know, what, what, what's, what's, it gonna, what's it gonna take to beat the Warlock at this rate, right? Like, he had the right. Breath of Dreams and the Overgrowth, found Mount Cellar and the Ammo Score pretty early. And despite all that, it seems so like Mega's the score, being able to have that plot with Kelly and Dan turn was too much for the Druid to come back. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a different build of the deck in, entirely as well. The way that it functions uh, without having the backup of uh, Glowfly Swarm into Soul of the Forest is uh, completely changes the way you can play it because all of a sudden now no hands gamer is just making stunted awkward ter plays every turn they just don't even come close to getting the job done against all of this from mega gliscor yeah i'm thinking emerald explorer has to do something very dramatic but even then i don't know if he wins oh he's gonna find the, the <laughs> six or prime there you go six or prime into gotta hold the moon fires right and just Trading everything in with a uh, uh, iron bark as well. It's pretty good. Iron barks are pretty solid. Uh, a lot of removal. It just means that Mega Control can't win next turn, though. He's still got some of his best cards yet to come here. Mm. Just wave one. Real bad, but gonna go ahead and hang in there. Zephyrus is now active. Whoa. Yeah, I mean, this is just looking close to unwinnable now for No Hands Gamer. This is one of the few situations where every good card to have at zero mana is still in Mega Gliscor's deck. He can get uh, the Alex, the Malagos, as well as the absolute dream here for just pretty much lethal on the spot, I think. Yeah. He does need to make some hand space, so Mark Artificer allows him to. Still guarantee that he has a uh, clear with the rate of fire. Oh my gosh. Pack it up. This is over. <laughs> for, uh, unless there's some kind of out that we're not considering. But it's looking unlikely. Murzond, which will play Zixor Prime right back. Although you don't get Battle Cry, so. He still gets plus one, plus three, and taunt as well. That's not half bad. True. I mean, he could even just make a huge Edwin on this turn if he wanted as well with Zephyrus into Edwin. Like, it's true. I guess. Oh, you actually, there was another opportunity too where he could play Murders on Zephyrus, and I think he would offer you Soul of the Forest. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either way, the only thing to even be slightly afraid of, I think, is Deathwing off of Emerald Explorer at this point, and uh, we can see even if that was there, he'd just have Lethal on this turn. So, no hands gamer is you know, swipe to remove some of the board. In fact, actually, swipe does double damage. Yeah. So there's off a big portion of it. But it's kind of like what you're talking about. No actual meat in the bone. And that should that just be game, I think. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Alago, Soul Fire, or Rain of Fire, Fire, whatever you want. <laughs> oh, I like this! <laughs> Yo, this is swag, for dude. lethal. Well, it's not for lethal. I kind of wish that he ordered it the, the yeah. way it would be, but that was cool. Still very cool, and a good way to equalize the series at one game apiece. Now, Warlock up against Quest Druid more and more as I'm seeing the to players, uh, or the players learn to play the Warlock better, I should say. I think they're getting a really good handle on the matchup, and unless they're playing very, very greedy lists of Druid, you're feeling in a decent spot as the Warlock, for sure. Yeah, so a 1-1 score. Uh, the Druid versus the Warlock, which is pretty even based off the Swiss record so far, mm. but has been Druid favored. It ends up going the Warlock's way, but you know it's kind of like we were talking about. This is a different Druid list almost entirely. Yeah. To the point where we maybe reevaluate whether or not this matchup does end up going through its way. So I'm sure if, you know, Radu and Bloodyface played their best of X over again with these lists, 
I'm sure the results would be different in terms of their score. Yeah, I, I will say that from the way Nohan's Gamer has been playing, I'm going to defer to him as, you know, one of the best players that is currently not in Grandmasters, but very possibly looking to move up. Uh, I, I think he's being a little bit hesitant, you could argue. Like, for example, not making the biggest Edwin possible in Game 1. I think he could have had a slightly easier time if he'd gone for the hugest Edwin possible there. This turn, holding back on the Ironbark, on the uh, Alex Straza, when he went with Bay Alex Straza as early as turn 6 or whatever it was, with all the gained mana. Uh, I think all those players could have made his opponent's turns that little bit more awkward, whereas with the way it played out, it meant that uh, Mega Gliscor could just go for the play of the Moag plus Netherbreath to clear off the Alexstrasza instead of being forced into the Dark Skies. And uh, it just means that there was slightly more flexibility available to Mega Gliscor because Nohan's game was being a bit reserved. Yeah, that's right. So it is, it is going to be interesting to see if that Druid can win later on, but look at this the next game. Quite possibly the most pivotal of the series. Priest versus the Warrior. Does the Priest, in fact, beat the Warrior consistently enough? And, you know, some people can even argue that if the Priest still wins 75% of the time, is that even enough, right? Because the Priest really needs to get the win <laughs> against the Warrior with there's so many Warlocks running about. It really, really does. But now for No Hands Gamer, we are seeing his uh, slightly unique build on the Priest here. This is not a list that I have uh, seen before. <laughs> I'm just seeing now, I'm wondering whether I should uh, bust uh, Hunter Ace here because he sent me a DM saying, I can't believe I almost lost to this rubbish. When, and I didn't know whose list it was, and it turns out, yeah, this is No Hand Gamer's Priestess. So you know what, Casper, I'm calling you out live on air. Because this is a very unique build of the Priestess, a much more tempo-oriented version with the Imprisoned Vile Fiends and the Grave Runes here as well. Yeah, you love to see it. Just, you know, the ability for Priests to also adapt. It's not like, you know, Warriors and Rogues and, and Warlocks are the only classes being worked on. No Hand Gamer trying to figure out ways that he can make his tempo options better I, I like the psyche split just because you know mm -hmm. when you have the ability to get ahead of, as, on the board as priests that's historically been uh priests best versions of their deck like the, the, the priest decks that we know have been the strongest in some medic games have always been the ones where they just like are able to overwhelm their stats yeah uh, with the exception of course being um the, the raza island No Hands Gamer has also uh, long been a fan of Imprisoned Vile Fiend. In his initial build of No Hands Warrior, this was uh, basically, I think, replacing the slot oh, of no. Warmall Challenger, which is now absolutely core in the list. But it's interesting to see him taking this kind of dormant synergy over to Priest, where it makes a lot of sense, similarly to how it did in Warrior, where you have a minion that you play out, your opponent can't interact with it, and then come turn four, you have Apotheosis, you have Grave Rune, you have a lot of these powerful buff cards that mean you are guaranteed a minion to throw down on it. I, I think this is some pretty innovative deck building yet again here from No Hands Gamer, which is probably paying big dividends in the Warrior matchup. Very much so. Although, uh, he still has to deal with his Wormall Challenger and a Marvel Smith combo. Mm. Oh, interesting. Another Apotheosis opportunity, while Breath of the Infinite might be super valuable if you anticipate a damage board being uh, on the other side of your this is an eight health minion this is very likely to stick until the following turn i will say even with a blood boil brute on the following turn that's still not enough to clear it off so i i really don't hate the idea of just going for apotheosis here uh just right. saying i really want to stick this on the following turn and at that point what can warrior do about a minion with 11 health and lifesteal in play yeah, I think it would take exactly double rampage. Right. Um, yeah, or, or, or some variation. Yeah, rage. yeah, yeah. Actually, but the thing is, if that happens, that's what still a now? really good thing for the the priest as long as they have another great point. To play, which he does, because um, I actually actually playing some games earlier this morning while we were like waiting. Uh, and I was playing a rogue deck against the warrior, and I mm. got a really fast questing adventure on board, which is around the same stat line. It was like a, like what? a seven seven no. or eight eight eight. eight, eight. And the yeah. warrior used double inner rage and rampage to kill, but they lost like all of their ability to go for the decisive. Sword. And I end up just outvaluing them. It was super easy to play. So this might yeah. be something similar. For them. 
This is very smart from No Hands Gaming. This is the weakness of Warrior, is its lack of hard removal. It's why the uh, the Bomb Warrior lists are switching over to including, uh, you know, Brawl, obviously, for a bit of hard removal, and also Shield Slam for single target as well. Uh, and so I think for No Hands Gamer, it's a good weak uh, realization of the weakness of his opponent's deck. And uh, whether or not he goes for it here, it's still a very strong pick. Yeah, now the question becomes, how do I press in the best mm. way possible? Because uh, he did see his opponent preempt trade and commit a rampage to it. If he chooses to remove through time rip, it is pretty vulnerable to a bunch of things mm. now. At the same time, Apotheos is number two isn't exactly a guarantee that this minion will survive as well. So uh, instead, he might simply just choose to keep buffing, or he can just play another proactive minion through Shield of the Galaxy. Mm. I think it's smart. I think it's smart for a couple of reasons. You know, everything I've already been saying over and over again, but also just the fact that Shield of Galakrond is a minion. It's always good just to throw down independently of what the board state is. Whereas a buff card needs something in play, which is what No Hands Gamer has right now. It's a high health minion, difficult to clear off. And for Mega Gliscor, the best option he has is trade the Blood Boil Brute for all of his mana. It is very vulnerable to AoE at this point, and I feel like you gotta clear off this board because you know what Warrior could do with some of these things. Yeah, for sure. And this is a position that I feel like Reese, again, is very okay with being. But despite the fact that Warrior gets to be proactive on the board, we're now at that point where the gamer should be able to play a variety of matches. Um, you know, part of the problem is if Warrior starts to snowball in the early game, uh, Priest can sometimes have difficulty with getting their card down efficiently and up quickly enough. Oh, Shadow Madness can be one of the best cards in the matchup for sure, especially when you're facing down a Bomb Wrangler on this board. There's some uh, interesting uh, combos too with Grave Rune and Shadow Madness that you can do. Very true. I, I also particularly Ooh. enjoy. Yeah, uh, unfortunately for No Hands Game of Bloods, uh, sorry, Mega Gliscor is not playing the version that includes uh, Terran Gorfiend, which is when <laughs> Shadow Madness goes from good to absolutely god tier in the matchup, but it's still a very powerful card. Very much so. Um, doesn't define the Dragma Overseer, which is another card which can help build some more presence in the community during the game. Two, very similar to Shadow Ascent. And if I'm Mega Gliscor, I feel Someone like this might be an opportunity to just try to develop as strongly as you can. What does that take the form of, though, here? Like, is it a preemptive green skin before you even swing? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good utilization of the mana. Yeah, and it's also a 5 4 on the board, so if your opponent yeah. doesn't have removal for it, you are pushing a considerable mana. I was thinking about that, though, because, you know. If, if he's going to set it up preemptively, he is giving no hand gamer targets to mm. these cards like Time Rip. Play the homunculus, and because there's nothing to do with it, Yeah, it was, I suppose, kind of tempting as a 2 2, but here is Priest, you know. You have the liberty of not having to aggressively fight for board every turn. There's going to be a pretty Ooh. significant tempo swing, though, with that Fate Weaver now having the second indication up. Good uh, point. Can go ahead and play his whole hand next to him. So tired. That risky skipper what? draw means mm. that there might be only one more pirate in the deck, unless I might have. If I see a Sky Captain, right? two Sky Captain on the board. Uh, that first one generated the second one, so I believe there's still uh, one or two okay. left in the deck. I saw the sky general, but... Yeah, I was We're this just... close to doing the uh, classic oh, infinite you. value joke just to annoy Sotl. <laughs> Decided against it. Well, I was actually kind of thinking, you know, speaking of value, I was thinking about, you know, just playing the Battle Rage. Just oh, yeah, yeah. A ton of card draw. And, you know, maybe the, the tempo plan can't work. 
combo plan. Yeah, the combo plan is still very much intact, not only, of course, because he has the card draws, dealing a lot of damage, but he still has the coin. That is a huge deal in this situation, because being able to go Gromash in a rage, coin into Bloodsworn Mercenary, is an absolutely illegal amount of damage. <laughs> yeah, it's obnoxious. Um, so it's funny because we talk about how you know, Warrior can take so many different shapes and forms uh, in terms of how they approach the matchup, mm. but you know, just the simple inclusion of the coin can generate their range to be in the 20s. Uh, and that's not even assuming that he's holding mm. weapons at that point. And uh, speaking of the combo you were talking about of Shadow Madness and Grave Runes, I'm going to see that combo and raise you a shadowy figure thrown in there as well. Oh my. <laughs> that's pretty uh, interesting. You have to be. A be careful about copying a minion that goes back to your opponent's turn, so you would have to kill it off straight away, but it's at the very least something to consider. I am sort of intrigued by... Oh yeah, he has to yeah. double trade it, because otherwise... Yeah, uh, yeah. Bad, but I am sort of intrigued <laughs> by... The... I guess he just wanted board space, right? I mean, he didn't play Fate Weaver. He played three cards. So... Yeah, yeah, well he, he won... wouldn't have had mana. And, oh my god, there is there are so many moving parts to this turn, Dan. Like, but the amount of things that Mega Gliscor could try and move towards on this turn are ridiculous. It's pretty absurd, and yet, oh, how much damage can you push? Or six to enrage twelve. I wasn't even considering lethal oh. here. Actually, I was looking at clearing uh, the board. As long. As what the Boombots now? don't kill him? Oh yeah, he just trades in the risk. He's trades first, in. So doesn't happen. Oh, yeah, right, there okay. <laughs> there we go. You found it as well. I was looking yeah. at like filling up the board space so the Bomb Wranglers can't spawn bombs and fireworks going off yeah, and all that yeah, nonsense, yeah. but it turns out, yeah, it's just lethal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is what we're talking about. Sometimes, despite your best chance to fight against the Priest, the Warrior just combos it out and just plays a different kind of game plan. No Hands Gamers Gambit. Pay off for this series as the priest gets uh, kind of crushed by the warrior. Didn't really feel like the priest was legitimately threatening that warrior at any juncture of the game. I think it highlights two things. One, the importance for priests to kind of stay ahead on the board. The moment it kind of lost that uh, the minion that had apotheosis, I think it's a vile. Thing. Yeah. Uh, he just kind of like didn't have much development that could keep up with the warrior. And second, how important card draw is to the warrior. If you can deny battle rages or you know stop them from getting value on their weapons uh, it is so big because the difference is night and day whether or not where you can get those combo cards um by keeping up their resources yeah I, d I think you've just hit the nail on the head there it's the combo of all the card draw coming in for the warrior and also the fact that they're playing the worst list for the priest to see you know when you're not playing eggs and terran gorfiend which the priest loves to see and you've instead got captain greenskin two copies of corkron elite all the card draw you can possibly have thrown in there as well it makes it very very difficult for the priest to consistently fight back against that combo potential and so now with the only deck remaining for mega gliscor being the demon hunter this is starting to look pretty scary for No Hands Gamer because personally, I uh, I think even though at a first glance the priest looked like it should be in a good spot against Demon Hunter with it having plenty of removal, plenty of heal, it's uh, a pretty difficult matchup given the crazy amount of card draw and uh, long term uh, longevity I should say that the Demon Hunter has at its disposal. Yep, Demon Hunter is going to be hard to deal with in the mid game regardless of how much removal you have. We've seen it happen. Multiple times at Grand Masters, Priest gets ahead. They're at 25 health. Demon has no minions on the board. They're at like yeah. five, six mana, holding like eight guards somehow because they have curved out awkwardly. And then the Demon Hunter wins it. Maybe No Hands Gamers list is uh, a little bit more tech towards this matchup, though. I can imagine Imprisoned Vilefiend being quite a lot better than the. Uh, uh, sorry, the Veil Weaver that he has teched out on the two mana slot, given that that can get on the board, be kind of pseudo stealthed with the dormant me mechanic in order for an Apotheosis to land or a Grave Rune. And at that point, it's pretty difficult for the Demon Hunter to fight back on board. All right, well, with 
this start when you see the vile fiend i guess you just kind of try and win the board as much as you can before that vile fiend opens. all you can really do but this is kind of what you're talking about that vile fiend with the apotheosis that inevitably will come mm. it seems really hard to that's do with nuts this yeah it really really does and even the rest of his hand is just good you know they're just good cards in the matchup fate weaver throw it down on turn four who cares about invoking it's just uh a way to lock down the board, which has consistently been the point I try to make about anti-aggro decks or control decks, however you want to frame them, against Demon Hunter, is that clearing is not enough. You have to pr uh, lock down the board with your own minions, which Priest is very good at, if given the time. I've never seen anyone choose Soul Split at this point. <laughs> Yeah, uh, mana burn is intriguing to me, given that it is a, a turn where your opponent wakes up with their right. mouth means, so it restricts their amount of plays. But that does cost you the coin. And then, of course, Chaos Strike or Mystery Choice. Uh, Chaos Strike is just the most powerful card. I guess he doesn't really trust the Mystery Box. Yeah, like if so if Skull of Gul'dan hadn't come off the top, that would be this easiest snap chaos strike of your life but with the card draw already kind of taken care of for the next few turns the mana burn does play around some pretty key breakpoints in terms of what the priest wants to do perfectly demonstrated by the soul mirror in hand one of the most effective aoe cards in the priest deck if you can go for that going into their turn seven when you have a big board it could just be lights out off of that single card pick so uh, i think it was far from an easy chaos strike there and i like that Meg mega gliscor took his time before choosing it. Yep, and now the Warglaze of Azanoth cleaning up everything. So, I mean, this is the position that Demon Hunter wants to be in. No minion on the board for Priest, no minion available for Priest the buff. Oh gosh, are you about to time rip a 1-1? One -one? Or sorry, a one drop. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it happens a lot in the deck, right? It can oh. get you some decent minions, like the Kabul Shadow Priest, to come down next turn, very potentially. Stealing the Volpira? Yeah, yeah it's all right. With so much damage in the hand of Mega Gliscor, I really wonder if it's time to start setting up a damage for the end game. You have hmm. to the Metamorphosis. Like, if Warglaze uh, hits twice. <laughs> Demons. Or even three times. There's, there's just a lot. Yeah, I think the turn for deviation, in my opinion, is next turn, uh, if at all, because Skull is obviously the expected play on turn six. But like you say, if No Hands Gamer doesn't put up any kind of reasonable defense, you have uh, a lot of incentive to go for Metamorphosis Hero Power on the same turn to set up for Hero Power Warglaive and second Hero Power on turn seven is a huge amount of damage. Uh, but I like playing the Volpira here to set up for Twin Slice plus Skull on the following turn, just to have options. Oh, do magic. That's kind of spicy. That's very spicy. And uh, I think pretty smart as well, because in these kind of situations against Priest as Demon Hunter, you're forced to clear off the board pretty much every turn because of the threat of Apotheosis. But if Consume Magic comes down, you don't necessarily mind. have to clear off every minion. If they're healing four or five health off of the Apotheosis one time and then you silence it, that game is winnable. Yeah, I agree. I think that you know, sometimes they rely upon the Apotheosis defensively as opposed to mm. proactively. And then uh, you can have a way to get past it. You don't even need the outcast effect. I grow and speaking of deviation, I think this is again the kind of turn I'm looking at where you go for Warglaives, yeah, instead of the Skull of Gul'dan. Even being able to get the Battle Fiend down for another big threat onto the board. Yeah, I really like this as well. So that way you can stabilize onto the board and you're still yep. pushing damage every single turn. Oh, Back, yes. This is a two turn lead. And it's that, it's that pronged attack, that double attack that you're going for, both on the board and from damage in hand. Priest has everything it needs to answer both of those threats. Removal for the board, heal for damage out of hand, but they can't do it all at once. Apart so from on this turn. Have to choose, um, you have to choose one or the other a lot of times as Priest because your 
cards are so expensive a lot of the time. Right. I mean, Holy Smite is nice, so you can remove something, and that theoretically should give you the ability to survive next turn. Honestly, that's, I think that's the best card. Wow, well the the play I was expecting there was definitely holding over hero power, but uh No Hands Gamer kind of taking the, the philosophy that I was uh, advocating for on the previous turn to heart here with uh developing the board, you know, not just clearing turn after turn, but getting your own threats in play which uh threaten the apotheosis most importantly. I Is this an opportunity for Nick to sort of drop Skull of Voltan, or does he just want to press in here with, you know, spending his other cards and using Skull of Voltan afterwards as a reload? I think I like Metamorphosis on this turn because what you're able to do is go Hero Power, Metamorphosis, Hero Power. The Metamorphosis goes face. Use one Twin Slice, which gets you up to five damage. Swing into the minion, swing face. You still then have a second Twin Slice in hand, which is the kicker because then Skull of Gul'dan can draw you Glaivebound Adepts and you can activate them on the same turn, which is potentially the extra push for lethal that Mega Gliscor would need to win the game. Yeah. And it looks like there's exactly where Mega Gliscor is. Choose to do that. Great call, Derek. And by what he very he's smart counting, uh, he has the opportunity to strike for lethal the following turn here. No hand schemer picks the Shadow Weaver. That's not particularly what he needs right now. But yeah. he could also try and buy some time with it by freezing the face so that Mega Gliscor doesn't at least have uh, opportunities to activate that uh, Glade Mount Death. But he still needs a little I bit more. Must now. consider. In fact, is this play to simply Holy Nova afterwards? <sighs> or, I guess, Breath of the Infinite? So he can heal himself? I think it might have to be. I mean, it's either we're looking at the Holy Nova and heal, or potentially freeze the face and then apotheosis his minion and heal his face if he thinks that he doesn't have time to play the apotheosis next turn so he needs to just play it and pray that it sticks on board or at the very least tank say a, a metamorphosis plus a trade of the one two i think you gotta sneak it, it there you the simply shadow. heal yourself up oh wow yeah I mean, we know the consume magic is right there i think it might be the line I mean, he's playing around cards that he knows are in the deck. Yes, yeah, yeah. Despite all this, there's still a draw for lethal with Kane Sun Fury, but... Very true. I mean, he could still just start with it on this turn. Skull of Gul'dan could still hit Kane for lethal. Ah, poor warlock. Ooh. It's true. And I guess, yeah, if he didn't have the... Oh, oh. <laughs> if you didn't have the uh, apotheosis, there was still a threat. Oh. The Shadow Weaver as a 4 3. I'm if really ready. enjoying. Sorry, go finish off, sir. I was say, if you're making a close court, just kind of throw in your power now. Waste that I think so. I mean, unless you want to play out the beaming sidekick, right? I don't really see why you wouldn't. And uh, the main point is just, I, I'm liking a lot of what I'm seeing from Mega Gliscor. I think he's had a very good understanding of this matchup overall, and uh, in terms of the overall game plan, but also just in terms of the small parts of the matchup, like going for the Consume Magic there to bring his I Beam back down to zero instead of one, because he realized the Outcast was actually raising its cost. It's, it's not a huge thing, and it's pretty basic when you get into uh, the top level Hearthstone, but he's just not, he's not making these small mistakes that we do see from even some of the best players in the world. Yeah, it's true. Mega Gliscor is looking very solid, uh, especially in some of those this tighter corners line. where he had the opportunity to be you know, a little greater. Yeah. And I yeah. like his timing, his pacing is great, and it looks like he's in prime position in this game and in the season. Yeah, I'm sure breaking a lot of people's hearts, No Hands Gamer is a player with a lot of fans back home. He has a very heartwarming and empowering story in terms of his Hearthstone career, and of course, just in terms of the decks he's bringing. It's true. We didn't really highlight it much, but uh, there's a reason why he calls himself No Hands Gamer. Because uh, he has some struggles with playing a lot of pain uh, with the play, so he goes ahead and uses eye tracker software to help him uh, play Hearthstone, which is truly inspiring for so many people because you know, Hearthstone is a lot of games for a lot of people, um, but part of the advantage of it is that you know because it's not super mechanically driven, 
yeah. you have the opportunity to find alternatives to play. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's people who sometimes might have to be really creative and use their feet maybe even to play Hearthstone if they don't have access to uh, their hands at the time. Um, so well, maybe I, like even... that he's able, I like that he's able to overcome those obstacles. Yeah, I was going to say, very creatively, some people could even use their brain while playing just to really go out there in terms of different ways to play Hearthstone. Not to get too crazy out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that wraps up our first featured match here for round number three. And as per usual, we have other matches on board as uh, we will be doing some round three filling with Raven and Gia. If you want to follow along with us, you can head on over to uh, battlefy.com slash HIZ Sports, where there's all that information about the Masters Tour, uh, as you can follow along the deck list and see how the standings are shaken up for your favorite players. In the meantime, we're going to take a brief intermission. So when we come back, more round three action of Swiss here at Masters Tour Young.
Welcome back, everyone, to Masters Tour Yon Ping. We are bringing you some more round three action. I'm Raven, and joining me for this one is Gia, and we've got some matches to cover for you guys. And we're going to be kicking it off, Gia, with Taco Tastic versus PNC, uh, both players from the Americas region. And the Americas region, for me at least, definitely one that has the, the spots up for grabs uh, in terms of at least the top three spots for Grandmasters. That's right. In terms of the highest prize earned by their top three slots. Americas has the most to gain and therefore a lot of things could still switch around as to who's going to actually be at the top there after the end of this Masters Tour and who is potentially going to enter GM or in PNC's case, root into GM? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? It's something we've been uh, following throughout the day and we will do throughout the whole weekend as long as it's relevant, of course. But the Grandmasters who have been relegated as recently as just last weekend uh, do have a chance. There is a world in which uh, if they perform well enough or win the whole thing, they will get a spot uh, into Grandmasters once again. So it's a pretty huge deal for these players because we know, you know, we cover these players for, for weeks on end, of course, for the seasons. We know how important being in Grandmasters is for them. And if there's a chance, you can just get straight back in. I have. Uh, I am not surprised we see as uh, as many ex GMs uh, as we are seeing in this tournament. But let's get straight into it. We've got PNC on the top. Uh, it's going to be on that druid, and uh, Taco Tastic is going to be also on the druid. As we go in a one and zero lead, I believe Taco won a Demon Hunter mirror in game one. Yes, that's true. PNC, of course, a player who has had his ups and downs making it to the global finals last year, but also recently relegated from Grandmasters and Taco Tastic, a name that most um, outside of the hardcore MP 
fans would probably not recognize that name, but he has been to several Masters tours already, had a huge grind trying to get there to Vegas. And, you know, I think he's one of the few people I've seen who says that he's okay with how difficult the grind is right now. (laughs) Yeah, at one point he had, what was it, like 10 top eights or something uh, clo- close uh, of online cups, uh, which is uh, not only just an impressive feat being good at Hearthstone, but an impressive uh, mental fortitude feat as well, as it gets uh, quite difficult to uh, go, go that uh, go that hard on online cups. But so far in the Druid Mirror, it looks like uh, PNC is playing that, uh, I guess, hybrid list. Uh, we've been calling it of the Emerald Explorer and the Breath of Dreams. But outside of that, nothing too crazy. We've been seeing some other players use Claws and a few other tools in there. But PNC is just using just the Emerald and the, uh, the Breath of Dreams. So we'll see if that pays off for him. That's right. Both players actually have that additional dragon package of the two Breath of Dreams, two Emerald Explorers. But you're talking about other additional tech that could make it. Taco Tastic's list has the one claw in there. And uh, both players only running one Power of the Wild. The difference is that Taco has two Savage Roars. So a bit more possibility for him to take a lethal out of nowhere. But so far, both players have not really hit their ramp nor a way to get the fire. Right. And I, I, I like the uh, the cuts. I, I don't mind the, some of the tech choices, but I like the cuts as long as they're not cutting Savage Raw, because I actually think that like, double Savage Raw is, is very, very powerful at the moment. Uh, so having uh, the opportunity to just uh, get someone from almost, or, or from easily from full health, uh, is something that's pretty important, or at least just multi Savage Raw within a game, right? But uh, mm-hmm. I think we're just seeing the moat there. It's just more, both <laughs> players just don't have access to ramp. Sometimes this happens, right? Like sometimes you draw only the ramp. My sometimes reason. you draw only the minions. Sometimes you draw only the spells. But now it's definitely going to be a no ramp game. Wait, is this what happens outside of APAC, GM? I yeah, was exactly. not informed. This doesn't look like Druid to me. Okay, but to be fair, at least both of the players are somewhat on equal footing. It really sucks to see Druid mirrors when person gets the blow fly, they run away with it because they have both Savage Roar. And of course, you can't really be running Starfall on top of the Dragon Package. I think that's a little bit too clunky. Um, so we could just see a strange pan out of dragons bumping into each other. Just Emerald Explorer on PNC side, he discovers another expensive dragon. And we could see Takatastic reciprocate with his own Emerald. Yeah, it's really weird now though, right? Because with the Mount Cellar draw... Is there a way he could take this any slower and save the coin? Uh, maybe not. Maybe he just needs to match here. Because even with the coin, if he coined out Mount Cell next turn, he of course still couldn't like bog beam, for example, on that right. turn because it's not true mana, so it's not active. But there is a lot of spells he could go with this, even if it's just coin Mount Cell and Moonfire or hold off and then have the, the natural seven Mount Cell turn and still have coin Claw, Moonfire, uh, Bog Beam as well. So just be interesting to see if Taco Tastic chooses to be a bit slower here, take a couple of hits early to have that big Mount Cell turn just a little bit later. Yeah, I think you made a lot of great points there. Um, yes, the Mount Seller would not be active with all of the discounts even next turn, but if Taco Tastic takes this turn to be a little bit, I think we see him dumping a couple cards here, then he just goes for the Emerald Explorer next turn as the curve into the big Mount Seller pay- payoff mm. you were talking about. And this matchup really is about getting big payoffs. If you just try to stick a Mount Seller and get a minion, a lot of the time, it just gets answered by removal on the other side and you don't have the big board. I was going to say that line makes sense because PNC was not showing that he had any pressure moment, but the top deck of Glowfly is absolutely huge here. Yeah, and, and this is another play I wanted to talk about as well is uh, the, the Glowfly, of course, fantastic, but the preemptive hitting into the Emerald Explorer makes sense. It makes it much more killable in the following turns. Right. But a card called Crystal Power exists, and I think we see it mostly on a Mount Cellar. If players aren't able to kill the full Mount Cellar, they try and set up a kill over two turns. If that's healed back to full for one mana, and the player can develop, that's like a huge loss there for Taco. And again, I'm not saying he did anything particularly wrong, it's just that he got punished for setting up the kill, because now, as you can see, the Emerald Explorer plus the Glowfly turn, it's just, it's almost a Mount Cell turn if you just uh, look at it <laughs> a little bit differently. And it's right. going to be pretty scary for Taco to deal with. 
It's the same. There's Soul of the Forest to pay off as well. So PNC can trade away some of this board, push face damage, and still maintain that wide of a board. For Takotastic, we did see him, uh, as you mentioned, throw away not one but two one cost spells and i say throw away not to mean like it was wrong to use them because he was clearly clearly cleaning right. up hand space to make sure that the emerald explorer which generates another card would still not put him at 10 by the end of the following turn but it also has that interplay of when he goes mount southern next turn he doesn't have a one cost spell necessarily to coin out but with the way things are going and pnc able to stick this huge board push a ton of damage and use his fungal nectar and to look for his store. Probably won't matter all that much. Yeah, this is just, uh, unfortunately, the way the druid mirrors go sometimes, where one player gets the board and the other just does not. Or I guess one player gets the board first and manages to stick it, uh, as opposed to anything else. So it's going to be very, very rough indeed for Taco to be able to do anything. But... Mount Cellar is sometimes away, as uh, as you guys over in the Asia Pacific region for Grandmasters know. Mount Cellar can uh, perform some miracles with Rush Minions specifically. Yep, all the Griffins. We've also gotten a fair amount of Ravens, uh, both of them represented on this board, <laughs> whether it's the Dread variant or the Messenger variant or the Caster variant. Uh, it's still looking pretty dicey for Takotastic, though PNC has chances to draw into, if not Savage Roar, for immediate lethal uh, power of the wild to make sure that his trades go in cleanly and he's able to deal with the Mount Seller also. Yeah, right now there is only that Iron Bark on the Raven that's actually stopping PNC, just lethaling from board. And, uh, you know, Bog Beam's going to help get through there. Was that just Moonfire, though? Yeah. The throw of the Mount Seller, unfortunate, of course, for PNC. But even the Bog Beam and uh, the Moonfire help a little bit with getting through. But I do think now if PNC can't push lethal, he might have to consider what he needs to do to actually kill this Mount Cellar. Yeah. As far as I can see it, he can push 12 damage face, including the Moonfire. It's a bit short, so I also agree that he'll probably end up trading some of these minions into the Mount Cellar. And that's not a big problem because all of the minions have Death Rattle and he can develop his second Emerald Explorer behind all of that. Yep, that's what I like as well. When you consider how many games of Druid you see, you go, oh, you know, I need this uh, this Iron Bark, right? Just If I just had a Taunt minion, if I just got a Taunt minion from uh, the Mount Cellar, well, that's kind of one of the other jobs Emerald Explorer does, right? Like I said, this board looks like a Mount Cellar board that's been Iron Barked because the, the Emerald just naturally has Taunt. So yeah, he could have gone for the second one. He did choose to actually just go, uh, go. I was going to say all in then, definitely the wrong word, but going a bit heavy there with the overflow, but that does mean he's very likely to draw into one of those Savage Rolls at least with only eight cards left now. Right, I actually really like that from PNC. Um, taking a look again at his list, he runs the one roar and one power of the wild, so maybe relying on just the natural draw from the deck. It's not really turboing out and trying to close the game as soon as possible. I like that PNC relinquished a little bit of immediate damage there, knowing that as long as he sticks a wide board, the payoff from Savage Roar compensates whatever damage he didn't push face last right. turn. Yeah, you often push a, a little bit more more damage with the Savage Roar than you can even uh, think about, especially even though the Overflow heals for five. It's uh, most of the time insignificant in comparison to the damage this will push, but I believe with Savage Roar, Power of the Wild, and even the Wrath, Crystal Power, Moonfire to help out with a clear, yeah. that is going to be that game number two, and it is going to even up this series one and one. And honestly, uh, it, it, it did look pretty one-sided, but that is generally how the Druid Mirrors go. It's normally a very strange mirror match if, if it looks even, because the, the decks just don't interact with itself that well. That's right. From APAC of all the weeks we cast it, and it is every single week because at least three players are bringing Druid every single week in APAC GM. We've cast a fair amount of mirrors and only I can count on my fingers the number of times that they've gone to a late game back and forth type of scenario. Right. And that's the type of pan out where, say, one player gets Glowfly, so does the other, but the first player doesn't have a way to buff their board with either Soul of the Forest or Power of the Wild to take value trades. And then it gets weird and heads into like Mount Solar trading into each other and Ysera wars, uh, wars, but it is a very, very fringe scenario. Uh, most of the time, Druid mirrors are snowball-y, as is the nature of the deck itself. Right. 
Yeah, and we can see now just how the lineups uh, have shaken out after the bands, both of which are Warriors, which is nice to see, of course. Uh, I say nice to see because I think it's the right choice, not because I don't like casting Warrior. I actually like casting Warrior quite a lot. But here we have the, the main difference on display between these two players' lineup is the Warlock versus the Rogue, neither of which involved in this game. So we can talk about that later now as we get straight into our game number three. Uh, Demon Hunter going to be on the top there for PNC and Taco going to be back on this Druid once again. That's right. The first game was played off stream with PNC losing on his Demon Hunter and Tacotastic took the mirror. So now there's potential for PNC to finally get a win on this and it's a pretty good matchup to do so. And with a start like Battle Fiend and Seder Overseer, I'm liking his chances. However, Taco has hit Fungal and Breath of Dream. Yeah, both players just having them. Um... Obviously, Taco needing the dragon for that Breath of Dreams to be uh, active, I'll say. Or, but really, both players having pretty solid openings. Honestly, just the Fungal Fortunes for Druid is such a big deal against right. Demon Hunter. Because one of the ways uh, I've seen it perform the best is when you get that early Glowfly. But if the Glowfly is not big enough, Demon Hunter can clean it up. Whereas if it's uh, big because of the fun early Fungal Fortunes, you've got a much better chance at sticking some of those Glowflies. Very true. The implications of drawing cards is just exponential here for Druid. It's not just the upside of having more options, it's that upside of buffing the Glowfly, as you said, the likelihood of drawing into ramp. And because in this particular matchup, you're pretty much pressed to expend some of your early turns by removing uh, some minions on the other side, you get rid of some spells. Having that extra draw makes it so that you're not just removing, but potentially developing the Glowfly right. as well. But for PNC, getting the sidekick onto the Seder Overseer is huge. It really is. It's just so much more of an awkward problem for Taco to deal with now. I will say, though, I'm getting almost whiplash from, from casting lately. First, I had to adjust from uh, the Asia-Pacific Grandmaster speed to European Grandmaster speed. Now I need to adjust back from, from just casting a certain few European Grandmasters that don't play the fastest in the world to casting some of these players who are playing insane speeds. Yeah, it really is a breakneck case. PNC there actually had, I would say, not the most straightforward game turn. You could go Frozen Shadow Weaver Hero Power there, get the additional 2-2. Two, two. You don't push the 3 immediately, but sometimes it helps to save the cane in hand so that there's no chance of it being removed immediately, and then you right. play it when the taunt's already on board. However, on exactly 7 mana, it would require Tapotastic to have Bog Beam Double Moonfire or oh, Double wow. Bog Beam specifically to deal with it, and it was not there. So that is, in the blink of an eye, another win for PNC. I just can't get over how fast. I feel like we're watching the games on double speed, and clearly that's just yeah. what a season of European Grandmasters has done to me. But yeah, I, I, it looked like pretty confident play from PNC. I think I would like generally just to see the players just slow down a little bit because you know pretty important tournament but i will say that the options look pretty clear and although i was definitely uh with you on considering the shadow weaver i think the point you you talked about of well for this to actually to get punished there needs to be quite the specific set of cards there for taco and we saw although there was one bog beam there was not two which meant that the taunts were left open and the game could end so pretty crazy overall and that just leaves pnc with rogue uh, how are you feeling about rogue at the moment do you like it uh, in its current builds or do you think it might be a bit of a weakness from some of these players Right, so for going into Yon Shipping, I was definitely advocating the two best classes plus Druid Hunter type gamer because I'm of the opinion that Rogue struggles against Druid and Hunter also has a pretty good advantage in that matchup in my opinion. But that was before people were messing around with this build that kind of came out in the later weeks of GM and really got more popular during playoffs, which is questing adventurers. I think that gives Rogue a lot more bites and the ability to fight back versus slower matchups like Quest Warlock, for example, and also against Druid. So I think that Rogue has a lot of potential, but personally, I haven't played this build so much, so I'm hmm. waiting to see how it shakes out. Okay, well, looking at this as we go into the mulligans here, uh, PNC, as you can rightly see, has a Waste Warden in his opening hand. That is one of the tech cards. It's only one of, uh, and everything else looks fairly standard. And although I'm 
not overly convinced by Waste Warden in this kind of rogue. I do like the fact he's running double quest adventure in there. I feel like that is just almost should be standard right now. It shouldn't even be much of a question because at least in this meta, it does work so many of the decks you're expecting to run into. It's good right. versus Warlock to help with Dark Skies and make the removal awkward. It's good versus Druid because similar to a lot of minions, if you get more than three health on a minion, it's kind of hard to deal with. Uh, and it's still, it's good in the, in the mirror matches. I don't know. I just feel it's so, so good right now. No, I really agree with you. The main criticism of Rogue in the Ashes of Outland meta was that it lost a lot of its aggressive potential. Galakron is really still so strong as a value generator, just being able to have endless lackeys and also High Sparrow and Togwaggle, but it would take a long time for Rogue to get rolling on that game plan and they would fall prey to quicker matchups in the meta. So running the questing as essentially another way to hit your high roll with Edwin, for example, um, gives it that much more threatening potential in the early to mid game. Right. On the other hand, Taco is playing a fairly standard version of Quest Warlock. There is the use in there with just one Questing Explorer. The Abyssal Summoner sometimes takes the cut there to run a one-off. I dislike it. I personally like the two Abyssal Summoners, so um, we see that from Taco. Uh, he did get the Sense Demons on Curve as well, which is, as you can see, pretty nice. Actually, it helps progress his quest, but also just helps fill up his hand a little bit to help with a Dark Skies drop. Gives him a nice juicy plot twist if he wants it this turn. I don't think there's anything particularly threatening on this board. Uh, it's just, I guess, not ideal because after plot twist, he ends up on nine cards. So if you tap, you still end up overdrawing on the following turn. Right. I wonder if that... Uh, would you ever consider doing Reign of Fire first? You obviously plot twist for less and negate the problem that you gain from doing it this way around. But that does set up for a, uh, without that, you know, without an Evolve Lackey or anything, it does set up for the, um, if a Netherwing is drawn, it does clean it up and helps, again, just remove a certain amount of health from the board if you have Dark Skies uh, in your hand instead, which we could see Taco does. It's probably a bit extreme, though, right, of a response to, to what he could do. Um, if this board were a bit more threatening on PNC side, I definitely understand where you're coming from. But I think um, weighing that versus the possibility of ripping the other plot twist off the first plot twist, I would much oh, rather sure. go for what Takotastic did here. And I also like that he preemptively dumping a mortal coil because he wants to be tapping next turn into the dark skies. Yep. It's important to note as well that that stunner was played just to activate the miscreant. And no secret right. was active, and most importantly, there was no target for it anyway, or at least no enemy target. Uh, so, although it's not a big deal, as you mentioned, Taco yeah. having to keep even an extra look at his hand if the, if he has minions on board is important, because you can use those stunners to bounce cards back and make the opponent burn cards, or then have to play more awkwardly in following turns because they already have a full hand. Uh, and although not not really the main strategy for the rogue player in any way, it is just something now that Taco can take a little bit easier, knowing that now there's only one stunner in the deck. True. This Vargoth is amazing. Gets him another proc of the Praise Galakron. Another invoke, another lackey. Um, PNC yeah, I think he's just dropped down Edwin, just counting up, I suppose, whether it's enough total health to play around a single Dark Skies. And this is a 6-6, I believe, so it will be pretty safe. Yeah, I think he was wrestling with the question of should he backstab or not, because backstab gets Edwin extra 2-2, two -two, but it means that Vargoth might cast backstab instead, which right. would then target either the Vargoth or the Van Cleave, which would reduce the two health in which you kind of gave it, right, But <laughs> with backstabbing. So a bit of just a, a, a I don't know, a few uh, mental backflips going on there just to work out whether it was actually worthwhile. Uh, I do think I like him keeping hold of it just in the long run, because one, it's just a good activator. And two, like, is it really worth the risk of ending up just backstabbing your own minion for, for no real reason? Very true. And this is such a problematic board now for Takotastic. 14 health represented. Even if he goes Reign of Fire first, there will still be 10 health left on board and he won't have enough in hand for just Dark Skies. So we might have to see him also rip a Soul Fire unless he's okay with taking the pain for this turn, softens up the board with, um, say, Dark Skies. I don't think you can afford to fit in the tap here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, it's, re it's, it's just not nice, is it, this turn? Mm. I was trying to look at if he can soul fire first and then just Dark Skies. But again, that doesn't really guarantee it either. Uh, the main point is, I think if I was Taco, I would, I would want to look wow. at just playing an Abyssal out on curve. Uh, because I feel like it creates much more of a threat than just you know, going all in on the removal. But look at this. Dark Skies and then take, what, 11? Yeah, it's really painful. 12 with painful. Dagger guaranteed? Oh. Didn't even manage to remove the Blackjack Stunner. That's a very unfortunate outcome. I mean, this would have been great if he had one more mana, but he really just had a terrible turn there. Um, I don't fault him for taking this up because even if you go for Dark Skies, I'm not sure if the Soul Fire is guaranteed to be good. Like, what if the majority of the damage lands on the Vargoth right. and then you still leave up the Edwin? So he's trying to just search for a better answer afterward, but it's not there. PNC can push a ton of damage, always take the head crack, and that's a Vargoth head crack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there were, there are other options as well, right? PNC could uh, could actually really just hit with the cleave and then shadow step it, do some stuff, and then replay Van Cleave again, which would have been huge just to create a much bigger minion. I do think Taco. I think he could have rain of fired Dark Skies, soul fired, pretty pretty often that, that would work but uh, I do think that would be in, too much to actually do and would ruin his hand uh, for the game so again just uh, echoing what you said a bit I, I do appreciate Taco going for that tap and just saying well you know what nothing I do is that good I just have to do my best to get a good next turn definitely like it from PNC to prioritize the board development over leaving a 2-2 vulnerable Vargoth just to get the head crack that was a little bit too meme of me unfortunate outcome with the evolve but it doesn't really matter because he is still asking the same question as last turn which is can you answer the Edwin except the Edwin is twice the size now yeah and this is the problem isn't it outside of exactly Kelly then mm. that's way too early for Twisted Nether right now, right? There's yep. nothing, so this uh, this Van Cleave can just run Riot, and with that flick, I believe that is a pretty straightforward lethal for today. Uh, just the uh, kill off the top, go face with the Cleave, that is game, PNC takes it over Tacotastic 3 and 1, and wow, so he lost game 1 uh, for Demon Hunter, he uh, made, made the rest of that series look pretty quick getting those 3 wins. It was really impressive. Throughout today, I've been seeing rogues just turn um, the matchup on its head against Quest Warlock in particular. Prior to the inclusion of the questing uh, adventurers, I feel like that matchup was pretty heavily in the favor of the Warlock. Um, not much threat in the early game, but it's now really taking advantage of that window where Warlock is still trying to get their quest completion and they can develop some minions that are out of range of Kray's Netherwing. And yeah, right. I think that what you said at the beginning of the day is starting to come to fruition, which is that Quest Warlock might be underperforming compared to what a lot of the field expected. Yeah, and, and that's it's one of the reasons I just love big Swiss tournaments like this, because we get so much data and we get to see it kind of just evolve o over each round. So it is pretty hype overall. And although that match was quick, that was pretty hype too. But we've got tons of our Hearthstone coming up and we have round four kicking off very, very shortly. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with some more Hearthstone.